Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Cisco Sponsor Track Sessions. My name's Gary. I'm going to be your host MC uh, for the afternoon. We've got four great sessions coming up today. Um, I hope you can join us for obviously this one and any of the other three. We've got two talks after this on our Cisco Virtual Infrastructure Manager, our NFV solution coming up right after this, and some Cisco and ACI talks uh, after the afternoon break. So uh, settle, settle in. If you didn't get one of our notebooks and pens when you came in, you can catch one on your way out. Uh, there will be a test, so take notes. I'm just curious, personal curiosity, for how many people is this your first OpenStack Summit? Really? That, okay, <laughs> that was not the answer I was expecting. Okay, uh, well, great, welcome. I hope you guys are having a great week. Um, there's lots of great stuff going on. Uh, so I'm gonna just get things going. Uh, our first session is multi-cloud networking uh, deployment options with one of our Cisco distinguished engineers, Shannon McFarland. So my content plus me speaking, plus right after lunch makes this perfect nap time. So it's, it's okay because I'm blinded by these lights and I won't notice that you're sound asleep through this talk. So it's, it's great. So welcome and uh, thanks for uh, appearing in the, the first of uh, several of our Cisco sponsored sessions. So the, our discussion today is around multi-cloud networking. Um, and this is uh, a very uh, abbreviated version of the talk that I usually do on this, which shows a lot of demos and CLI and a bunch of stuff around that. Uh, but uh, we're going we're gonna to introduce this topic in here um, over the next 40 minutes. Uh, my name is Shannon McFarland. I work in the cloud CTO group at Cisco, focused on um, OpenStack and Kubernetes and um, Istio and uh, linking all of these technologies between uh, enterprise on-premises locations to a multitude of different public cloud sites. And so we're going to uh, spend a little time to, together on this topic. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is uh, at IPv6 with EYE. Uh, IPv6 is also another technology area that I've covered for uh, about the last 18 years of my time at Cisco. So uh, hit me on Twitter. It's a great way to get a hold of me. So a quick look at our agenda. We're going to just kind of do a level set of what it uh, means to talk about multi-cloud networking. Uh, and again, we're not talking about the entire umbrella topic of multi-cloud in here, which is um, movement of workloads, etc. Our topic today specifically is around the networking piece. So we're going to talk about the traditional hybrid cloud networking and how multi-cloud differs from that. Uh, then we're going to kind of walk through some of the uh, design options that are available to you uh, from a high level on how you extend on-premises environments via networking into the public cloud and then begin to add uh, multiple public clouds to that mix and then we're going to wrap up with some automation around it. So a quick level set. So the, the first thing that comes to mind is how does multi-cloud networking differ from hybrid cloud networking? Well, they really are the same thing. You're just dealing with multiple locations instead of just between a single on-premises environment and a single public cloud provider. So when we look at multi-cloud networking, we are in, in many ways when we are taking a cookie cutter approach to design. Um, we want to basically link an on-premises environment to a public cloud and then formulate a nice repeatable design from that first uh, effort and then we want to repeat that across multiple cloud providers. So this brings a lot of uh, consistency to our design. We can uh, reuse a lot of tool sets that we have between providers um, and we'll work through some of those elements in here today. Again, you know, consistency is pretty important. So some of the things that we're going to talk about in here today, um, when we have a goal set around consistency, like using identical technology and tool and product sets, um, brings that level of consistency that we're after. We can reuse technologies such as IPsec or BGP or uh, a wide variety of other technologies we'll talk about between them. But sometimes um, we actually have to alter the types of tools and the types of technologies we use between uh, two given uh, entities, such as our on-premises and a public cloud site. So we'll talk about those. 
Um, you're going to have common network transports that you're going to use in nearly every one of these types of designs. So you categorize those with first dealing with encryption. So most uh, enterprise InfoSec accounts um, are going to have a requirement for some level of encryption. This could be a plain, uh, you know, HTTPS uh, 443 type of over-the-top design. This could be a dedicated IPsec tunnel between locations. Um, whatever the case is, you're going to have some level of encryption to deal with. Uh, next, you're going to deal with some level of routing, and we'll talk about that uh, when we get into the topology options. But routing could be just as simple as creating a static routing uh, uh, configuration between your on-premises environment and within your public cloud. Uh, it could be that you're leveraging the BGP support that a public cloud provider has. And then you may even want to extend the routing topologies that you have inside of your existing enterprise and extend those IGPs inside the public cloud itself. And again, we'll talk about when you would want to do that and how you would do it. And then finally, you're going to have some sort of encapsulation. Uh, you're going to wrap that encapsulation uh, with some sort of uh, IPsec, and then you're going to um, start to push your actual data plane traffic inside of that. And again, we'll graphically kind of walk through what all of these look like. You also have common network endpoints uh, between most of the public cloud providers, and we'll talk about uh, the big three in here. We'll talk about Amazon, Microsoft Azure, and, and Google Cloud Platform. Um, and all of them provide pretty much identical support when it comes to native VPN support, uh, colo or service provider peering support, um, and then some level of hybrid between those two. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, each of those. Now, one of the things that people come to me from a, from a, a customer perspective and they ask, why would I want to even go down the path of dealing with multiple cloud providers? Well, sometimes it has to do with just plain old high availability. You've got, you know, multi-region support, multi-AZ support within the public cloud providers, but sometimes you want multiple service provider or more, multiple cloud provider support. And so this is definitely something that has been a recent trend in the enterprise space where uh, someone has been a traditional AWS they, uh, account, they have dealt with multiple AZ, multiple region, and, and they've got that nailed down pretty good. Uh, but for continuity um, of their business, they want to add at least one other public cloud provider. So that's a, 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 you know, the first relevant driver. The second one is probably the most relevant driver. This is something that I encounter all the time, and this is where uh, the enterprise is uh, happily moving along with one of their public uh, cloud relationships, and then they acquire or are acquired by a company that uses a different public cloud provider. Um, and for a period of time, at least, they're going to have to deal with at least two public cloud providers. It may be something that over time they migrate back to a single uh, cloud provider, but uh, for the most part, most of the customers I know that go through an M&A um, and are adding another public cloud into the mix, uh, most of the time they stay that way for quite some time. So that's, uh, that's another driver. And we'll actually speak to these, uh, these last three as we kind of move through some of the designs. So let's talk about uh, extending our on-premises environments to these public clouds and then uh, see what some of the design options look like. So um, for today, uh, there are many public cloud providers out there, but for today, we're actually going to talk about uh, you know, what we typically call the big three, Amazon, Microsoft Azure, and, and uh, Google Cloud Platform. But since we are at the OpenStack Summit, um, you can go down and uh, refer to all of the OpenStack public cloud providers as well. So that there's uh, uh, definitely topologies that fit into that environment. So the first couple of options that we want to look at when we're extending our on-premises environments into a public cloud provider is what type of connections do we want to look at? So one of the best ways to begin this relationship between uh, an encrypted private connection between an on-premises environment and a public cloud provider is what we call going over the top. Um, this is simply allowing public internet connectivity to public internet connectivity and creating an encrypted transport between those two. And that's basically what the top picture looks like and we'll spend uh, most of our time in that space. The second is, okay, I have matured to the point where I like this relationship. I like what I'm doing in the public cloud. I like what that particular provider is doing for me as it relates to my needs uh, for my workloads. 
um, now I want to establish a higher speed, higher uh, uh, available type of transport option between the two, and that's where you would uh, sign up for something that is, is based upon either a service provider or a co-location uh, relationship. Uh, this topic we could spend an entire day on, on, on what all of the, the options are from each public cloud provider and so forth, and I've got some links at the back where you can go find some more information about that, uh, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time in here because it's, uh, it, it can be quite uh, an involved discussion because the way you do it varies wildly between each of the public cloud providers. So the place we're going to start is going over the top using native IPsec VPN services. So all three of the big uh, public cloud providers provide this service, uh, and it's absolutely the fastest way for you to get up and running uh, between connecting your on-premises environments uh, to a public cloud provider. So we can see here on the uh, left side of this slide, this is Google Cloud Platform we're showing, but again, AWS and Azure have these exact same services. So what the service components look like is that from the on-premises environment, you are going to use a virtual or physical platform that can support whatever encryption and routing type you care about. In this example, we're using IPsec, uh, but you could do SSL, VPN, or, or um, uh, you know, wrap encapsulation with uh, a wide variety of tunnel types, GRE, VXLAN, et cetera. Uh, and also you would look at whatever your routing type is. In this example, we're looking at BGP. Inside of the public cloud provider, um, you're going to have at least two components involved in this relationship. Uh, for example, in the Google picture we're looking at here, we have uh, the Google Cloud VPN service. This is strictly an IPsec VPN service uh, that you can build as either a single connection or you can have a high availability connection we'll talk about here shortly. Um, and then the second component is the routing component. And again, all of the cloud providers offer these two discrete components. So the, the uh, Google Cloud Router, uh, very similar to what uh, AWS and, and uh, Microsoft provide, is strictly the BGP component. So this allows you to have dynamic routing relationships inside of your uh, public cloud provider and exchange those routes dynamically with the routing infrastructure inside of your enterprise. And so, so we'll begin to kind of expand on these designs. So then you begin to uh, add more and more stuff to this, right? And so this begins to, to uh, kind of take over from a design perspective is that you, you find an easy place that's repeatable, it uh, has the bandwidth you're looking for, you settle on a good high availability design and then you start to add from there. And so from this graphic, uh, we can see that we've got multiple clouds, maybe these may be multiple locations you have inside of your enterprise. Um, and you just create more and more IPsec connections into each of these regions that you care about. Now, what happens on the enterprise side is up to you, of course, right? This is your choice on how you want to build these out. So you can use virtual routers, you can use physical routers as the, as the uh, Cisco ASR1000 at the top of this. You can use firewalls. Um, you can even, even though I'm a, a, a Cisco employee here, you can use virtual routers that come from the open source community, right? This is a, a pretty popular option that you can have. Um, I don't really care what you use in this regard, but you need to make sure that you are building upon something that's repeatable when you start to move into the multi-cloud arena because there are very strict requirements that each of the public cloud providers have around what type of IPsec and IC parameters you can support, how your BGP configurations look, and you need to make sure that whatever platform, whether it be hardware or software, that you begin with is something that can carry you through when you move into a multi-cloud environment. So now let's uh, begin to start to move into a multi-cloud view. So again, whether it's because we want service provider or cloud provider high availability, or if it's because we have acquired or have been acquired by a company that has a different cloud provider than we began with, whichever one of those reasons you have, um, we can begin to add these public cloud providers into this view. And so we can kind of see here uh, as we walk through these slides that we began with a, um, a Google Cloud platform, let's, for uh, the argument's sake, in our example that uh, we have acquired a company that's an AWS customer, um, and we are simply beginning to extend the same design that we had with Google, we're extending uh, with AWS. And again, you can flip that out for Microsoft as well. 
So what happens, though, is as we begin to modify our encryption and our routing uh, infrastructure for this, for example, we may be wanting to actually link workloads that exist in one public cloud uh, to workloads to another public cloud, and we want to do that without ever traversing our head in sight, right? This is, uh, the, you know, the hairpinning problem that we have uh, in traditional WAN topologies. And so we begin to build a mesh in this environment where we are establishing not only connectivity from the main site to the public clouds, but between the public clouds themselves. The challenge we get with this is the WAN mesh problem. This is where we begin to add multiple sites with multiple regions, with multiple availability zones, and we begin to get things completely out of control from a routing and an IPsec and an operations perspective. Uh, so the challenge we tend to have here is where do we stop and make a change in our operations, especially if this is a production environment, to begin to embrace something that's a little more modular, it's a little more dynamic. Um, and this is obviously up to you when you hit the brakes on this type of static built design uh, and move away from these native VPN services. So some of the justification for stopping and rethinking this design um, is on this particular slide, right? When we start to encounter wanting to extend the things we have in our enterprise directly inside the public cloud, these are the items uh, that we consider uh, from a justification point of view. Now, we now not only have to do that from a business uh, perspective, what are the costs associated with doing this? How, do, how much does it cost me to run this full mesh type of environment in this static built environment? But you also have to look at the technical aspects of those designs as well. So the first one uh, is actually a bigger problem than you think. Uh, everyone understands what network address translation is, right? In the IPv4 world, we are providing some level of translation most likely between an RFC 1918 private addressing uh, scope to a publicly routable addressing scope. Um, and when we do that, we are doing that behind NAT. Well, when you introduce address translation and encryption into that mix, um, you've got to have some pretty robust support for things like NAT transparency. This is an RFC that allows you to discover that your encrypted components are on one side or the other of NAT. This uh, can become a challenge when you are starting to do encryption between yourselves and a public cloud provider. So you need to make sure that the public cloud provider that you are using um, has support for NAT transparency, or if they don't, you need to have a good plan to work around NAT transparency. So uh, this may be alone a driver for you to change how you are building your IPsec environments, because by default, when you're using a public cloud provider's environment with, um, without NAT transparency, you will, you will absolutely have broken IPsec connections. So you need to check for that provider support. Another one uh, may be that you want to extend your routing uh, topology inside of your enterprise directly inside the public cloud. So this is actually one of the biggest drivers uh, that I help customers with is when they're an OSPF shop or an EIGRP shop inside of their own enterprise and they want the routing infrastructure inside their public cloud to look just like the rest of their network. Maybe it looks like a WAN office, maybe it looks like another data center, but they want to extend uh, that routing support between those two. Another one could be that you want to take advantage of features such as quality of service or uh, high availability or network monitoring in the same way that you're doing inside of your enterprise. All of these are drivers towards moving away from a traditional native VPN service inside of that public cloud provider and moving into something that you control on both ends. So one of the views of that is uh, a great technology that's been around a long time that Cisco invented many years ago. It's now actually in the open source community. Um, it's called DMVPN, Dynamic Multipoint VPN. And so you can take a look when you get the slides here um, or just uh, do a, uh, a search on Cisco DMVPN. Um, and this is a technology that allows you to uh, drop in a virtual router inside of the public cloud. In this example, we're using the Cisco CSR1000V, which is just a virtual uh, iOS router that you can grab out of the Amazon marketplace, et cetera, um, and deploy it in replacement of the native VPN router that the public cloud provider offers. 
When you do this, you get all of those things that we talked about on the previous slide. It's iOS on one side and iOS on the other. So I can now run all of the VPN support, all of the IGP support, quality of service, network monitoring, all of the programmability that I'm used to in iOS from Cisco perspective now exists not only in your on-premises side, but also in your public cloud side. So you really get uh, continuity operationally as well as feature continuity on both ends of this. And so this allows you to break out of that full mesh, point-to-point -point manual configuration uh, by utilizing dynamic multi-point VPN. This allows you to create a set of hubs, for example, in your head end and uh, build the spokes out in your public cloud uh, environment and the two will discover one another um, through their configuration and establish point-to-point -point connectivity not only between themselves and the head end, but they will also dynamically discover any other spokes that are out there. So this is super powerful when you are wanting to dynamically link workloads from one public cloud provider to another public cloud provider without ever having to reconfigure anything. And again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about that from a configuration perspective in here, but if you go and take a look at this link in here uh, that I provided, there's some great information on how you do this in, 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 uh, within the CSR environment, especially in uh, areas such as Azure and AWS. Now, another option that you have available to you is utilizing SD-WAN or software-defined WAN technology. So uh, Cisco has two SD-WAN derivatives. Uh, one is through the Meraki family product set, and the other one is the Viptela uh, acquisition product set. Um, and the SD-WAN is a great addition to your multi-cloud solution because what you may be doing from an SD-WAN environment today, which is traditional branch connectivity, um, in, in a, a traditional WAN environment, but you can also place virtual form factor routers, again, in AWS, Azure, et cetera, um, in the form of what we call edge routers, or the V-edge router or the C-edge router. And again, there's some more information here on this link. But you can, again, go to the, uh, the marketplace of your favorite public cloud provider, do a search for uh, a Cisco SD-WAN appliance, and you can launch this appliance in a high availability configuration. Um, and then just add that connectivity into your existing WAN transport. So this is really great in a branch office solution where you may have branches that want to ha uh, have conditional access maybe into Office 365 as a SaaS service, but then you also now have uh, maybe AI or ML connectivity requirements from a branch, and you don't want that branch to traverse the hub to go all the way back across to another VPN. You can actually link those two dynamically directly from your branch site, directly into the public cloud provider, um, and never have to touch the configuration and never have to deal with traversing your hub uh, site. So that's, that's a, a, a nice option for you. Now, once you've kind of settled upon what you have from a transport uh, perspective, um, how would you go about automating some of that? So some of the challenges that we have in automation have nothing to do with technology. Most of the challenges we have with automation has to do with your own political environment inside of your organization, right? Because uh, you may have a network operations team that uses a completely different tool set uh, than, uh, you know, somebody that's actually running the workloads uh, between the two sites. So some of the challenges that you have is not only um, the tool set themselves, you've got a, you know, maybe uh, one group likes Terraform, another group likes Ansible or Chef. Um, you also may have totally different environments that you're programming against. Maybe you're running OpenStack on-prem and you're running Kubernetes workloads inside of AWS from an EKS service. Uh, whatever the case might be, you've got to come to terms with understanding which tool sets are appropriate for which environments and then settle on how you figure those out. You also may be using vendor-specific tool sets, and so this is where you need to settle are, are you uh, deploying your WAN and routing topology using something like uh, Cisco NSO or Cisco Prime or you're doing NetConf Yang programmability against them? Um, and then you want those same tool sets to actually tie into programmatic um, uh, deployment of the workloads themselves. So there's no silver bullet to any of these, but if this is your first go into programmatically controlling some of these things, uh, some of the things that I recommend customers start with are, are kind of listed here. Um, 
First off, don't start out learning a brand new automation framework when you're building a very robust multi-cloud environment. Use what your team already knows. So pretty much all of these automation frameworks have modules for each of these cloud providers. So if for example, if you're a HashiCorp, you know, Terraform shop, they've got modules for the public cloud providers as well as OpenStack. Um, and so you can start with that, figure out if you need to add to or change that environment. Also, automate the things that hurt the most to do a lot of. Um, so a lot of times customers will, will use just plain Jane CLI um, if they're deploying a resource that very rarely changes. Um, it's something that's fairly static, it's a high availability kind of configuration, and they don't change a whole lot of it, um, then you can kind of tend to uh, move with a manual kind of tool set. Uh, the second one uh, there is where you are doing a lot of change on one side of the cloud connection. For example, if you've got a lot of change going on in the public cloud side, then customers tend to gravitate towards the tool set from that cloud provider. So uh, GCP Deployment Manager, AWS CloudFormation, or Resource Manager from Azure, um, those work great natively in that framework. Uh, the challenge you tend to have with that model, though, is once a team learns that cloud provider's tool set, the second you add another cloud provider, guess what they're learning all over again? that cloud provider's tool set. So that's when you want to then potentially look at abstracting your tool sets from an automation perspective, again, back up to something like Terraform, or maybe even look at a, a commercial uh, solution such as Cisco Cloud Center, et cetera, uh, that can kind of abstract those backend environments away from you. So before we jump into Q&A, I know this was kind of a, a quick trip through uh, multi-cloud networking at a high level, but, but uh, there's a lot of information for you to go and grab in this first bullet point. So the Cisco multi-cloud solutions page um, will talk about all of the products that we just talked about, what the transport types are, what DMVPN looks like, what SD-WAN looks like. We've got um, automation guides to include cloud formation templates, et cetera, that will help you deploy virtual routers, IPsec, BGP, all of those things, and you can go and find that information at the top link. Um, you know, some of the high-level things in this summary, I'm not going to read them all, but, you know, public cloud connectivity works great if you are trying to just start out. But you will very quickly find that you're probably going to need better feature support, um, larger and more robust tool sets around dynamically provisioning those IPsec links, and that's probably going to trigger you into an alternate design, uh, two of which we talked about in here today, DMVPN and SD-WAN. Uh, the final thing here is there is an awful lot to think about in multi-cloud. We just kind of, I mean, barely scratched the surface on multi-cloud networking, but you need to really thoroughly research um, the things that each one of the tool sets uh, that your team is going to have to consume, uh, what the impact is from a production environment when you start with one transport type and then move to another transport type. Um, those are some of the big ticket items that you have, okay? So that's our time. I've got 10 minutes left here that I want to take uh, questions on uh, and uh, jump. Or you're just like blown away by the pace of this and want to leave. So all your multi-cloud networking problems have been solved in that's 30 right. minutes? That's right. We, no. got, we have two mics in the center. I've got one up here for questions. We've got about nine, ten minutes. This is your chance. Cisco Hall of Fame presenter, Shannon McFarland. <laughs> you don't get this opportunity often. They're just now waking up, Gary. Yeah, don't, I know. Don't, don't frighten them. It must have been a very carb-heavy lunch. That's right. <laughs> Great. I'm here all week. No <laughs> questions now. Stop by the Cisco. Okay, all right, fine. Right, yeah, okay. go ahead. Someone's got to break the ice. Yeah, just thought I'd try and break the ice. Just throwing a random question, it could be completely useless, but um, from a developer point, of, developer point of view, it'd be really awesome to have something like, um, you know, a couple of Kubernetes um, Helm deploys where you could kind of deploy into three different um, isolated clusters where there's some kind of public internet connectivity um, and then just kind of link them all up. Is there anything on your SD-WAN or something where you could kind of, do you have any more experience going up the stack towards Kubernetes? 
Yeah, so, I mean, hopefully everybody heard the question with the mic, but is, you know, do, do we have experience with basically going up the stack from, you know, adding into uh, the services themselves in addition to the multi-cloud networking? So, um, there's actually uh, a, a, a great solution out there, one of them from Cisco, uh, is the uh, CCP platform, the Cisco con uh, Container Platform, which is a Kubernetes environment that allows you to run uh, on-premises and then uh, if you want to can conditionally begin to trigger um, the behavior of a public cloud provider's Kubernetes environment. And so those types of things um, are available from a technology perspective. The challenge that you tend to have is operationally do you also want those same tool sets that are dealing with the programmatic deployment and operation of Kubernetes to also programmatically deal with the networking under them? Um, and so that begins to uh, leave you not from a, a question of a technology point of view because you absolutely can programmatically deal with spinning up, for example, VPCs and subnets and NAT gateways and all the other things, you know, VPN, you can do all of that programmatically. Uh, but you've got to make sure that operationally your, your staff and your infosec and all those other things are going to allow that because a lot of times it ends up actually being a roles problem versus a technology problem um, to allow those linkages actually to take place from a programmatic perspective. So, if that, I mean, we can talk more about programmatically what types of tool sets you could do to actually chain those uh, series of events together. Uh, but yeah, there's, uh, there's all kinds of ways of doing that, not to mention there's all kinds of ways of actually establishing uh, different types of Kubernetes deployments that are stretched or are they, you know, federated types of environments. There's many things to, to consider that in addition to the networking. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the network service uh, mon uh, modeling. Uh, we know that some of the community are looking at the Tosca. Some of uh, them looking at Yang. What's your opinion about the uh, uh, service modeling when we're facing the multi-cloud networking? Uh, I don't have an opinion. Uh, <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, it really is a, uh, it depends, right? Because some things uh, are, are perfectly applicable for some use cases and not other use cases. But again, it's less about the technology consumption or even the policy consumption and more about what's aligned with the actual enterprise or even the service provider's case in that regard. So I mean, we can, we can talk about what your specific environment looks like and take that one offline. Uh, but generically, I, I'm not the kind of guy that stands up here and says, thou shalt go do this particular technology or implementation type. Uh, because what I would recommend with one customer could probably most likely blow up in another customer, right? So I, I kind of take those on a, a one-off view. Anything else? Anybody else? Now, I know, Shannon, you had a bunch of links and stuff in your presentation. Yep. For, for those of you, and I know we saw a lot of first-time hands when we asked the question. OpenStack Foundation generally has the, the videos of these talks up on their YouTube channel within 24 to 48 hours. So if you didn't manage to catch a screen grab of a link or a reference uh, or a resource that Shannon had in his presentation, uh, go to the OpenStack Foundation YouTube channel and you can find Shannon's talk, go back to parts that you want to go over, find a link or a resource that he mentioned in his talk. I think let any last chance, two more minutes? That's I'm it. Around, okay. I'm around all week. Thank Have you. A good one. Thank you, Shannon.